G'day, welcome to Mark and Sam After Work. Um, today I want to go through a, a bit about helping people with their group shooting. Um, now there's a, a little bit to go through and I'll try and um, put it uh, keep it as concise as possible is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but it's about group shooting for most people that's obviously shooting at 100 yards. Something I do very little of. We do it when we have to, we do it to get a true zero rather than just a bore sighted zero, get a true zero on scopes. We do it uh, sometimes to go through and, and verify rounds and things, but we do very little of it. To be truthful, the way I consider it, it's a little bit like Mandar, um, which is for those people who know what that is, that's shooting at paper with, with handguns. Um, I don't like it, it, it frustrates me, it's something I'm, I don't really like doing it, doing it a lot. But the fundamentals of how to shoot a, a rifle extremely accurately are as much involved in trying to shoot a 100 yard group as they are trying to shoot a plus 3k shot. Um, and I, that's I suppose I want to touch on a little bit. Um, and the difference is there. Um, and that is one of the things that's a little confusing for people is there's a lot of tactical and hunting equipment that are designed to help and make shooting at 200, 300, 600 yards fairly long range hunting shots which um, believe it or not don't need the same sort of accuracy as getting your best group or shooting like I said plus three Ks. So, a couple of things I want to go through in, and to try and explain what's going on and to try and make sense of all that. Um, what a lot of people would consider is that if you've got your crosshairs held, um, your shoulder up to your rifle and your crosshairs are on your target and you have your basic fundamentals in whether it's preload or free form shooting or whatever it is and you have the crosshairs dead on and you get a good clean trigger break at that point, then your job is done. Uh, well, uh, that isn't the case. Your job's not done. I would say um, your job is still in gear. You still have a lot to do with getting your shot right for several seconds after you've actually broken the trigger. Now immediately, the moment that trigger break has happened, even if you've got all your fundamentals right, there's a whole heap of other things that are about to happen. To start off with, what happens when the rifle goes bang is you get a shock that travels through the barrel. Um, it travels in lots of different places, but there's a shock that happens in the, in the metallurgy, in the molecules in the steel, that travels a lot faster the bullet up and down through the barrel, um, up and down through the barrel while the bullet is actually traveling out through the barrel. And this is what they talk about with nodes and that side of things where essentially you have a vibration happening, coming and going, coming and going vibration where it's where it moves and it, and it moves less and ideally you want the bullet to travel at a speed that ends up going through the end of the barrel when the vibration is at its least. And this is a little bit what the load development's about. Um, it's also what um, some barrels they'll suggest to make with some calibers in particular lengths and all that side of things. And uh, although yes it is real science, it is real stuff that makes sense, um, in, in most cases it's not something you're messing with, so it's not something to put too much thought into, um, although in the final levels of things it will come back into play. Um, the bits that really matter um, is that, as I have mentioned, things happen before the bullet leaves the rifle, before the bullet leaves the muzzle. To start with, the, the most obvious and easy thing for anyone to see, um, and you know, I go on with obviously muzzle rise, so if you have your barrel jumping up, a lot of people consider that's happened after the bullet's left. It starts before the bullet leaves, um, whether it's induced by the total rifle action or it's induced by the muzzle break, that movement starts before the bullet has left. So you would be, and I should touch on this, if you do the same thing every time, you do exactly the same thing every time. So let's say in your setup, your muzzle rises as you shoot. If you have exactly the same preload on the back of the rifle, exactly the same movement, all the things every time exactly the same, then although your 100 yard group or your zero point might be 
I should say, your zero point might be a tiny bit different to someone who shoots differently. If you do it exactly the same every time, then you'll get a, the perfect group out of your rifle. It's going to shoot with, with the fact that the same movement, the barrel moves up the same amount before the, bull, the bullet leaves the rifle, you'll get exactly the same. Truth is, although that is conceivable, um, the nut behind the butt is a human and we're not consistent. We, by nature, some are worse than others, but by nature we are irregular. So it means that what the way you make the nut behind the butt do things as accurately as possible is by getting your system, your rifle and your systems and your processes to where they control your irregularities. So the first thing that happens if you ignore the finer stuff of nodes and of um, barrel vibrations and of the other bits that you don't control is to what you can control. When you look at a normal rifle shooting on a bipod situation, you have traction at your bipod feet of more or less depending on your setup and then you are shooting behind the rifle. So you're hard at that what most people are doing when you try and just shoulder up to whether you're prone or you're bench shooting is your job is to hold this dead still while sitting on the front here and the hardest bit for the person who uh, the average shooter is to hold the crosshairs still and as I said a lot of people think that as long as they get the crosshairs still break the trigger smoothly it's going to go straight as I've said not the case what's going to happen the moment because you have traction here and you have force here what's going to happen when it goes bang is the rifle is going to go like that it's going to go bang and back up again. That's what's going to happen. That's simply because that's a fulcrum point here, traction here. You're going to have the rifle wanting to tilt. So we all know that in, in a couple of things that it's easier to make it stable with the likes of a bag. And here I have a little hunting bag. And this is where I draw reference to the 400 yards, 600 yards shots in hunting shots. Um, 100 yards, whatever you're doing, that sort of thing. This sort of little bag is a great help. Um, under the back of the rifle, you then have a place to make that stable. Um, in this sort of bag, in this sort of setup, you can change your elevation nice and neatly by sliding backwards and forwards. Um, you can also use your non-trigger hand to squeeze to change your elevation. So all that sort of stuff looks like that would be perfect. And I, without question, you can use this sort of setup if you can get a bag to where you can in a prone situation or a bed shooting, that sort of stuff, you can get a nice firm trigger position or a crosshair position to be able to shoot like this. Now here's the thing, this is a bit that, that I've seen and it's one of the things actually I watched some of the group shooting of people testing ammo. Um, of people showing how the rifle shooting and things like that on YouTube and some of this stuff well truthfully frustrates me a little bit. This sort of stuff there's two problems I've got with this system um, and like I said I will qualify that for certain sort of shooting it is really the only way it's a great option it works really well for certain stuff but if you're after precision you want to get down to where you can shoot as well as you can so I'm not talking one MOA I'm talking under one MOA I'm talking probably under half MOA you're trying to find everything out of it then this has some serious issues first of all when you're squeezing your bag to make elevation that works good for hold but the moment it goes bang two things are happening one, you're supposed to have relaxed your body. So if you've got your off-shooter hand clamped, getting in the right position, then you haven't relaxed this part of your body because it's holding the bag, because it's holding the rifle up. So there's a tension in one side of your arm because of this. So not always going to wreck everything. And like I said, if it's completely consistent all the time, it's not a problem. But once again, a regular human is doing this you are causing a tension that really shouldn't be there. So what tends to happen actually you watch and I see this in our setup as well in different situations the moment you've run out of adjustment you've worked you've gone to a place where you're asking for that little bit more all of a sudden you will find that you start to get some elevation changes in your shot. What's actually happening is that the moment that bag is squished up if it's relaxed it'll sit there when it goes bang it'll squish the bag back down. 
and then you've got to squeeze it up again. So what's actually happening when the gun cycles is it's going down for that instant. The other thing, as you can see here, which I remedy in a different fashion, is that adjustment, which is great for elevation adjustment in, the, in, a, in a moderate precision shot, so you can then get onto it nice and easily with that adjustment. When the gun cycles, you're getting exactly the same thing. The gun goes back, the gun at the back of the gun goes down, the front of the gun goes up. So those are two things that I see as a moderate issue. There's another detail I touch on while I'm looking at this setup here. What a lot of people do with the likes of these Atlas bipods, great bipods, and in, once again, moderate precision, being able to tilt the bipod forward on 45 degrees. Um, I'll take that out for the moment. Take that out for the moment so it's not confusing things. On 45 degrees so that you can get down low. A lot of people are running minimum elevation in the back of it, holding things, got everything down low. Lots of things I can say I don't like about that, but the, whether it's a bench or whatever it is, they're sitting down here and they don't want that height, so they get this less height at it coming down like this. This is another thing I see with a problem with. Like I said, great in some places for, for real precision, for fine precision, I don't like it. Because when the gun goes back, not much movement here, it's only a light gun, but what happened with this, just a little bit of movement, because of the angle of these legs, it's going to go down. So you're going to get the nose going down as it cycles. So if you tilt them the other way, it's going to go up. Only an issue for extreme precision, but if you're shooting in this sort of setup, little bag under here, it's all comfortable, you got it to where you shoot on the bench, and you're shooting with a rifle like this, then I would tend to find that you're going to find an elevation variance out of the fact of in slightly inconsistent pressure because you are just a human on the back here. Like I said, some people it's going to work for, by and large, that's a mistake as far as I'm concerned. Now, to go through that, what I'm actually talking about there, the way I answer it is a couple of things. I don't shoot with a bipod like that. That's why you'll very rarely see me even position it like that, although I get it why people do it. Um, but straight up and down, you've got a straight cycle backwards and forwards. The back here, I tend to run a bag rider. Now, I'll grab another rifle so I can show a setup on that score and we'll carry on with this conversation. <sighs> okay. Well, that's another rifle, very different. Um, I don't want to get confused, it's a chassis rifle this time, really ignoring the bit in the middle. It's a, it's a lot bigger rifle, that was just a 22. Um, this, is a, this is a SORM, but I don't want to confuse that. That doesn't really change anything. The difference I've made here when I'm talking about to start off with is a bag rider. Now, this is one of our own bag riders we make for the MDT. I'm not trying to make a sale out of that. What I'm trying to show is that simply by having a horizontal bag rider, which is the same level as the, the same parallel, or it's in parallel to the barrel, means the straight forward and back action means that as it cycles, the whole lot moves straight. Now that all answers that and is a nice thing to do with that question. And you'll see, you know, the other way, I'm talking about um, bipod shooting, um, which is where my focal point is. My comment would be that if you look at the guys who do group shoot, and then we're not going with the railgun side of things, but if you look at the guys who shoot a semi-normal rifle um, that run on a full bag system, they have adjustable at the front, they have a big broad stock at the front, the whole, and then they have a flat at the back and they have bags front and rear and that sort of stuff. Their whole process is the same thing, to get that rifle to move dead straight. And that's a place that you can look at people who really do this as that's what they want to do. Shoot as the smallest groups they can. Part of their process is that, to keep that rifle moving smooth. There's other details I'll go back to their systems, but what I'm trying to create with both bipod movement, how that cycles, and the rear of the rifle, is that there is consistency. Now, you can look at this and say, okay, that's all I need. That's all he's saying. Put a rear bag on. No, I'm not saying that because this bag still has issues. If you have a point where you are trying to adjust your height and you are squeezing your bag to get your elevation, the squeezing hand's still involved. If you get it to where you've got to squeeze it up, get it all positioned, then shoot, and, it's, and it squishes that bag because the bag isn't fully condensed, then you still have the same issues. Now, 
once again, not trying to make sales, but the answer that I had for that is our adjustable bag base. So you can use a simple little bag like that. That one needs to be raised. I'll raise that up a little bit so it makes a little more sense. I tend to be operating in a taller position. There's other logic I've got to that, which is in other videos talking about that. But what I'm really talking about is that my remedy to and a, a, to keeping that bag dense, keeping that bag so it's solid, is giving myself a way to adjust my elevation with an adjustable bag base. Now there's other ways to do this. There's, th this is not the only way by any means. The likes of the F-Class systems, the likes of a lot of the, the bag shooting I was talking about, they will run a fixed height rear bag and have adjustment in the front. So whether that's an F-Class bipod where you can actually adjust it, where you've got a a vernier or a dial that you can actually adjust up and down in the back here, in the front here and keep the back the same. Um, or it's in a full bag setup where you've got a wheel so you can adjust at the front. It doesn't really matter. When, what we're talking about is that the rear bag stays condensed, stays so it's solid. Um, I prefer to use rather than a little hunting bag like this, then I'm using an ear bag so that it actually slides through the middle and has support on either side and this system has adjustment left and right on it as well which lets you actually tweak things around but the focus on what I'm actually talking about is that that bag doesn't move so how you do it is up to you but if you've got that bag so either you're squashing it with your hand or you're um, or you're puckering it up to be able to shoot and because you have your crosshairs still when you have the trigger break, you think you've got it under control. The truth is you need to have it more rigid in the rear here. Now this is only about precision, precision shooting, if you want the best groups. The other bit I'll touch on in the group side of things, which is another bit that nags me a little bit, is that um, group shooting is maybe not what some people think it is. Well, I suppose what I'm trying to say there. When I see videos where guys shoot five shots of one sort of ammo and five shots of another sort of ammo and five shots of another sort of ammo, and they do three or five or six different sorts of ammo and they do five shots, sometimes three, but you know, the guys who are trying to do a bit more so do five shots group and call that how that ammo shoots in the gun, drives me a little bit crazy. Um, the, my way of shooting, I'm still a human. I still stuff up. So I wouldn't call one, I, I can't do a five shot group and call it that. I won't do, I'll have to do five five shot groups of that same ammo and get the real feel for it because it is complex trying to get it all spot on, takes a lot of effort. The way I group shoot is at my extreme long range and I need my ammo to be hitting all in that same place um, and there's conditions that mess with me as well out there but I can see what's actually happening out of that. But I'm shooting 20 and 30 rounds and 50 rounds and going from getting a real feel for that ammo. Um, my, my thoughts are a little bit, in some cases, I'd like to give people a placebo of put them in different boxes and paint them different colours and, and see what actually happened. I think you'd end up with a valid, seemingly valid result where this stuff was better than that stuff and yet it was all exactly the same. Um, and then there's so many other areas that are complicated on that score. Without going too far into that, what I really am talking about is adjustment. I said I was going to touch on another thing, and that is even with this bag, we use this little Allen bag, there's a couple of things that we've done in our, in our adjustable bag base which are down the same road. I'll just get some other bits, I'll be back in a second. Okay, these are other bits that we've, we've got here. Um, the nature, what I'm really going to talk about this time is the density of your bag. Um, I don't really consider weight of the bag, what, how heavy the stuff inside there is relevant. I do consider how much you can pack down. And most of the stuff you buy in bags are okay and they work fine. But then there's the level of accuracy you want to get to and how much you've actually got movement inside there as to whether there's still any squish or not. Um, and I'll go through the process of something that for the people who do have our bag base I talk about. We did a little bit for weight, a little bit for um, uh, ease of manufacture, 
have a couple of adjustment sections to go under the bags in a bag basis. And everyone, everyone who's got one has got a couple in the, in, the, in the first three versions has some of these foam things, which essentially pack up your bag to different heights so you've got even more adjustment out of your bag base. This is made out of foam rubber, and overall it's, it's moderately thin, it doesn't compress too much. Once I found shooting on heavier rifles, both in the little bit of squish, little bit of rock you can get out of it, but also there is a level of um, inconsistency that you can actually get once you are not just putting a heavier rifle on here, also de dealing with heavy recoil across it. What I found to make a little better, a little bit about packing it up, were, but a little bit about the, the heavy recoil as well, was I simply made some wood blocks. Something that the average person is either going to be able to get, like all carpenter to make um, or something that um, they can make themselves not complicated this is just a couple of pieces of, of wood I'm actually glued a little bit of, um, of a heavy grippy rubber on top of it but this is something for that exact same reason taking this system that is already fairly rigid but making it more rigid um, that's something that anyone can do and it is something especially in the heavier rifles but also guys who want to use the maximum height it actually works quite nicely because it gets rid of the flexible foam, foam side of things. This still works as a good place for lower calibers and that sort of stuff, and I still used it. Most of my big shots, I use this stuff on it. But there is a subtle improvement in going to making some wood stuff. We could cut them up and send them out and that sort of stuff. Freight becomes your killer on that side of things, so probably easier to do locally, really no cost in the, the materials, but that's something that we found there. The other thing that like I said, I'm going to touch back on the F class and that side of things in the world that, you know, I'm not new to be talking about this, but it's relevant for people who are going from that world of tactical shooting and hunting shooting with softer bags and squeeze bags and that side of things, is that if you go to the world of F class and people that have always been chasing extreme precision, you'll find bags like this lump here. Nice made leather bag very rigid and dense inside here, stitch in a form that keeps it very, very set to your rifle, but the strength that you get out of, um, or the, the rigidity they've created, a heavy base on that side of things, is all in exactly the same place. We designed another level of bag base to be able to accept these larger fellas, but my comment isn't, once again, to try and create a sale. My, oh, my comment is, to go with the fact that people who have been doing this for a lot longer than I um, have been in the same place, keeping it rigid, keeping it to where there's less flexibility, keeping it to where that cycle is straight forward and back, even when there's a big whack going on, so you get a big thump going on. Um, and I suppose I would qualify that to another level as well, is that you'd be surprised how much thump is actually in even smaller calibers. Um, there is still a level of common sense and a level of flexibility that has been involved in trying to shoot in tactical shooting and that side of things but these are all details that you can feed in in different places of how you shoot things I don't suggest to use every bit of your kit and everything you do but the one bit I'm talking about right now is in group shooting 100 yard group shooting which comes into load development which comes into into trying to see that best group and trying to prove everything right and really comes from um, both my looking at things and saying, okay, how can you really validate that sort of information when I can see how your rifle's behaving? I can see the thing squatting down the back. I can see the nose is lifting. You can see your form is, is struggling with your setup. And my thoughts are simply that's a knowledge-based thing, but I don't know the rest of the details. Uh, but I do have to answer a fair few questions on both Facebook and on YouTube. Um, and an email about why I can't get to this place, why I get to this place and I struggle. And it's generally people trying to stretch out and that really comes into a couple of things. The, the biggest thing with extreme long range is in conditions and not understanding them. But when you actually follow it through, you find that a lot of the evidence of that person's struggle is at closer ranges. And it's to do with setup, it's to do with the uh, it's aware I, I don't use much, but recoil management is certainly a, a big part of what we're talking about. But it's actually the complete gun cycling. Um, and all these things matter, but regardless of whatever set you, setup you've got on, 
the, the density of a rear bag, the straight forward and back action of what you're doing and how you're keeping that density at a set, tight, at a set um, consistency is very relevant to getting the best grips you'll get. Anyway, listen, I hope that makes some sense. Um, there is, um, it is my thoughts on the subject. It's certainly something that I see a fair bit of. I get a fair, fair, fair few questions about. And it's something that, like I said, there's a lot of people that have already answered this many years ago. But in this semi-tactical precision world, um, there's people who are not quite getting it right. And hopefully that's some information to help them. Anyway, thanks for checking us out, guys. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching the video guys, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, down below here we've got a link to our web store where we have some of the specialised long range shooting products that we actually produce. Check them out. And for those of you who can, it'd be great to get some help. In our store we have support bits and when you purchase those the money goes direct to our channel and helps us bring these videos to you. Thanks guys. See you next time.